when you go to work and you log in in the morning and you're on the network and you log into your computer and then you begin accessing file shares, how does that happen? How does that authentication work? And what's to stop a hacker or a criminal from eavesdropping and sniffing your traffic on the network and figuring out what your password is as you send that across the network? We'll discuss all of that today as we talk about Kerberos. Hi, I'm William. And welcome back to the SMB Secure YouTube channel, where we're focused on helping small and mid-sized companies improve their cyber defenses and reduce the risk of breaches. Welcome back to another episode of 5-Minute Friday, where we take complex cybersecurity topics, we break them down, and we explain them to you in 5 minutes. Before we start talking about Kerberos, I need a couple things from you. I need you to tell me in the comments, what would you like to see a future 5-Minute Friday on? What cyber questions do you have that you would like answered or complex topics you'd like broken down in five minutes? Then, as you watch today's video, if you find the information helpful, you want another five minute Friday session, hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you want. So let's put up five minutes on the clock and let's start talking about Kerberos. So Kerberos was developed by MIT or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a authentication mechanism for network environments way back in the 1980s. Now, what you have to remember is back in the 1980s, computer networks were not nearly as common as they are now. They were much so in their infancy. So the problem that Kerberos sought to resolve is this. How do you have multiple computers, servers, workstations, different operating systems all communicate on the network while only allowing people who should be on the network to talk to the other servers and computers on the network? And how do you do this when you have different operating systems? That's how they came up with Kerberos. Now, because Kerberos uses asymmetric cryptography and third parties to verify authentication without ever transmitting a password, there's something we have to talk about and understand. And this is the concept of a trusted third party. You see this a lot in cryptography and encryption in general. Here's an analogy. If Bob told me that he worked for the CIA, I might not believe him. I might think he's trying to show off, he's making up a story or something else. However, if a trusted third party, say a mutual friend, both mine and Bob's, who I trust and Bob trust, tells me that Bob works for the CIA, then I'm much more likely to believe that that is the case. And that is exactly how the concept of trusted third parties works in cybersecurity and encryption. We validate who someone says they are. We validate certificates and all kinds of things through trusted third parties. There are three basic entities, we'll call them, in a Kerberos realm or environment. Number one is the client. That is a person or a service. Think something like an authenticated uh, FTP service that needs access to a resource. Number two is the application server or the service that the client wants to be able to access. And number three is the key distribution center. And that is the trusted third party that issues tickets to those clients. If you're in an Active Directory environment, the domain controller is the key distribution center that handles this. Okay, so we'll look at the Kerberos authentication steps in one second, but first here's another analogy to help you understand the concept. Think about a hotel. When you arrive at the hotel, you have to check in, right? You pay your fee, you validate that you are who you say you are, you show them ID, something like that. Then once they have this information and they have your payment, they issue you a key that you can use to access your room. And this key is much like a ticket would work in Kerberos. The key, lets you access your room and other facilities in the building. Depending on the level of your membership at this hotel, you might have access to the exercise room. Some You might have access to the cafeteria or the breakfast room where you get food. And that depends on your membership level, right? You simply present the card at the rooms that you want access to. You swipe it or you hold it next to the reader and you get access to that room. When your stay at the hotel is over, that key no longer works. And Kerberos is very much like this. So the Kerberos authentication steps. Number one, a client wants to access a resource, say a file server in the network. So they send an authentication request to the key distribution center, the KDC. That request is encrypted with the client's password. And this is important because it can incorporate a password without having to send that password over the network. Instead, that request is encrypted with it. The KDC checks that request it already has a copy of all of the pass user's password hashes. So it knows if it can decrypt that access request with the password hash for that user. If it works, the KDC assumes that the user is who they claim to be, since only they should know their password. Of course, we know that is a weakness in assuming this. 
but that's another conversation. After the client authenticates, their authentication request is disregarded. It's no longer needed. Step three. So the KDC goes ahead, it creates a ticket to give to that client. This is what the client can now show the server to gain access. This ticket granting ticket, as it is called, is encrypted with a password that only the KDC knows. No one else needs to see that ticket. The ticket expires in a set interval, usually eight hours, and it's stored by the client in the volatile RAM so that it's never written to disk. If the computer crashes, something happens, it's obliterate it and an attacker can't get it. Step four, when the client is ready to access that file server, it looks in its Kerberos tray, the Kerberos storage tray, that one in the volatile RAM, to see if it has a key for that application server. So it doesn't because it's never accessed the file server. So it sends a copy of its TGT, that ticket granting ticket, back to the KDC and says, hey, I want to access the file server. Well, we didn't quite make five minutes, but we're just about finished. So the KDC gets the request. It verifies that the client is already, already authenticated, so no need to authenticate them again. Now, the KDC ensures that it can still decrypt that TGT with the encrypted password it has for the client. We know the client still is who they say they are. If it can, it knows this is a valid TGT that it sent earlier. Now, the KDC creates a ticket that the client can use to access the file server. This new ticket is encrypted with the application servers or the services password that the user is trying to access. So in this case, that ticket is encrypted with the file server's password. The client receives that ticket for the file server and presents it to the server that it needs access to. So it goes, takes the ticket, goes to the file server, says, hey, I have this ticket from the KDC, says I can access you. File server, trust. If the KDC says that the client can access, they're a trusted third party, then everything should be okay and the individual should be able to access that file. So that is how Kerberos works. Once again, if you found this video helpful or you'd like to see a future episode of 5 Minute Friday on the SMB Secure YouTube channel, hit the like button and let me know it was helpful. Leave a comment, let me know what topic you would like to see in our next 5 Minute Friday Cyber video.